Hey, Sweat Sisters. Welcome to the Pretty Girl Sweat Show, which highlights women who are balancing demanding careers with a healthy lifestyle and hurtling over personal and professional obstacles. I'm your host, Aisha DeVore Branch, and each week I have a sister to sister chat with an inspiring go getter. And listeners learn how good things come to those who sweat. If this is your first time listening, what up? You could be anywhere in the world and you're here with me and I really appreciate that. If you love what you hear, take a second to subscribe to the podcast so you get updates every time we drop a new episode. If you got half a second, leave a rating, which will help other sweat sisters in need of some inspiration find our podcast. If you have a minute, please follow us across all social media platforms. We are at Pretty Girl Sweat on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter and YouTube. Use the hashtag Pretty Girl Sweat when sharing this episode. And if you have five minutes, please leave a review and let us know how we're doing. You're listening to episode two, season 18 of the Pretty Girl Sweat Show. And today I'm chatting with Kara Golden, the founder and CEO of Hint. Her healthy lifestyle brand produces the leading unsweetened flavored water, as well as a scented sunscreen spray. Kara has received numerous accolades, including being named Fast Company's Most Creative People in Business, one of Fortune's Most Powerful Women Entrepreneurs, and Forbes 40 Women to Watch Over 40. The Huffington Post listed her as one of six disruptors in business, alongside Steve Jobs and Mark Zuckerberg. Previously, Kara was Vice President of Shopping and E-Commerce Partnerships at AOL, where she helped lead the growth of its startup shopping business to a $1 billion enterprise. Kara is an active business speaker and writer, and in 2016, she launched the Kara Network, a digital resource and mentoring platform for entrepreneurs. She also recently launched the podcast, Unstoppable, where she interviews founders, entrepreneurs, and disruptors across various industries. Keep listening to get blown away by the journey that led to her success. I'm doing well. Um, I'm so excited to be speaking with you today. Um, there's so much that I want to know that our listeners want to know. So this is a great opportunity. So thank you. Yeah, totally. Super, super excited. So and and um, I certainly, you know, we had met through Hassan. I heard that he just had a baby, uh, another uh, baby. So yeah. I so mean, anyway, so precious. When I tell I you, oh. Oh my god! I'm, I'm dying. Yeah, I'm dying. So anyway, I, my kids are so much older now that it's uh, my youngest is 13, and you know, just wants to play. You know, the the game, the different games on the TV, and you know, he's still my my guy, but he's he's uh, not a baby for sure. I know, but I'm sure he'll always be your baby. That's how my my kids are to me. I'm like, you'll always be my baby. <laughs> no, it's so it's so true. Like, yeah, it's so crazy. So, how old are yours? Okay, so I have an eight year old, a ten year old, and then I also have a stepdaughter that just turned twenty three. Oh my god! Yeah, so that that is crazy. And does she live close by? She lives in Philly. Oh, that's not that bad, though. Yeah, it's not bad. She was just here for her birthday, so we celebrated uh, during Super Bowl weekend. Took her out to have a ball. Yeah, having a ball. So, um, but speaking of children, and um, I really want to start with your childhood and just learning a little bit more about your upbringing and maybe how a healthy lifestyle was either a part of it or maybe it wasn't. You know, I grew up in Arizona. Actually, uh, ended up. Moving there when I was a little, little girl, my dad, uh, we moved from Minneapolis and my dad, I think, was going through a midlife crisis and decided he wasn't going to shovel snow anymore with five kids. And so he uh, moved us down to Arizona. I always joke that in, in into Scottsdale and I always joke that we were like original settlers there because there was no one there. Like it was just I mean, there were 100,000 people in Arizona when I moved there. It was crazy. And uh, so it's a very different situation than it is today. And uh, anyway, my dad actually had worked for Armor Food Company at the time. He had developed a healthy line of, uh, they called them TV dinners back then. Um, so, so like Stouffer's was kind of the big one out there and wasn't very good. It, a lot of people thought it wasn't very good, including my dad. And so my dad had this idea to, actually create a healthier version of Stouffer's TV dinners and he called it healthy choice. And so he did what? that. In, yeah. 
And so he did that inside of Armor Food Company. Wait, and, your dad um, like fed me growing up. Hold on, wait a second. <laughs> I know, isn't that crazy? <laughs> That's crazy. Oh my God. Okay, keep going. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. So he uh so he developed this, you know, line of foods and you know, inside of a like he was sort of an entrepreneur inside of a large company. And um, which, you know, I always tell entrepreneurs like I actually know the difference between those two things because, you know, you have lots of money and support and all the stuff, right? When you're incubating a company and you don't, and you also have the sales force that can actually go out and sell your product, right? You don't have to build it from scratch, which is, you know, what we've done and what other entrepreneurs have done. So, but anyway, so he developed a healthy choice. We used to tease him that, you know, most people uh, who, who go back to my mom had decided when I was in kindergarten that she was going to go back to work and um, she was an art history major and she had decided she really liked fashion and so she went and got a job at a um, at a local department store called it's called Goldwaters and uh, she sort of worked her way up in Goldwaters uh, to she did she ended up being a buyer and then she ended up like I think she was one of the original personal shoppers. Like she, she had, we had so many kids in our family that she knew everybody in Scottsdale. And so she used to like tell them, Oh, we have this amazing collection of, of Ralph Lauren and, and I'm going to set it aside for you, um, you know, for the next week and nobody will touch it until you have a chance to come in and pick out the best stuff. And so, so anyway, she, she was super passionate about that and loved what she was doing. And, and uh, like I said, my dad was, you know, trying to trying to create like this meal basically because he hated Stouffer's TV dinners and my mom wasn't home by five o'clock every day. And um, we used to tease him because most people would actually learn to cook. But instead, my dad, you know, decided he wanted a simpler, more convenient way to actually get his food. And so he uh, he actually hired a um, very famous chef who spent uh, some time in, uh, in our kitchen, Julia child, but I had no idea who Julia child was. I just knew that she drank a ton of wine with my dad in the middle of the afternoon while they were like creating these meals. And so as a little girl, I call my mom at the store and bug her. And I'm like, mom, dad's like drinking a ton of wine, like this afternoon. And, <laughs> you know, he's making all this and she's like, Oh, it's fine. Like he's not driving. He's just like hanging out and whatever. And I was I just thought it was like weird, you know, that this was going on. But anyway, so he, you know, went on to develop, you know, what is today, uh, Armor Food Company got bought by ConAgra. And today it's one of the most successful product lines for ConAgra, which, um, yeah, I mean, he's, he passed away a few years ago and, you know, I'm still just super proud of him and especially being in the, you know, drinks and food space. I mean, thinking back on, what he believed so many years ago and, you know, like sourcing was really important and the backstories. I mean, he used to tell, speaking of Georgia, he actually uh, founded um, his, his first dinner that he actually created for healthy choice was a seafood dinner. And he actually sourced it off of uh, St. Simon's Island, Georgia. There's, there's a bunch of like shrimp fishermen and so he would he would actually go out on the shrimp boats with these fishermen and he would come home and tell me these stories about how like they they basically the shrimp fishermen give up like their life in order to like provide great quality food and you know they're getting up at like three o'clock in the morning in order to go out and get the best fish so that people can actually like buy this great fish like that's where you would actually get the best shrimp so um so it's funny because today very rarely do you hear large companies talk about sourcing and you know backstories of what people gave up in order to give you what you wanted you know to buy or eat or what however you want to look at it but it was um it was you know he was way ahead of his time well because of him, I mean, would you say that he would, is your biggest inspiration? Because the both of you have pretty much kind of revolutionized like products that people normally use or consume, yeah. and then made them healthier. 
Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, I, I talk about, I mean, there's so many people have inspired me, but I also talk about my mom. I mean, she was an art history major. And like I said, I mean, she just decided it, when I was born when she was 40 and which back then was like really old to have a baby. And um, so, you know, I'm 40, she's 45 years old and decides to make a career change, right? Like that's a big deal. And she really decided, you know, she had, she had actually done, uh, she taught art class in, in grade schools. And then she was doing a little bit of substitute teaching while I was, you know, really, really little. But then she just really decided like what she was really passionate about was fashion and, and she just loved it. And she still loved kids a lot. So she ultimately was, um, really focused on the kids departments for everything that she did. But, you know, she worked until she was 80 years old because she like loved what she did and she was so passionate about it. And I think like that for me is also a huge inspiration because I look at, you know, life is a choice and you, you know, work on something that you're really passionate about and you really love. And then it doesn't seem like work. Right. It's like right. it, you know, some days are harder than others, but basically, you know, you're, you're focused on something that you really want to be doing too. So I think like between the two of them, um, I also have a brother and older, we, uh, you know, I'm the last of five kids, but I have an older brother that's almost like two different families. He's 15 years older than me. And, uh, you know, I, I, I'm in the process of writing a book right now. So I was just writing this chapter about him. That's interesting. I mean, I remember him coming home from college and again, I'm like a little girl and, uh, and, uh, or actually he was in law school at the time, uh, down in Tucson at university of Arizona. And he would tell me before he was coming home to like ride my bike around the block and find the houses that, uh, that needed, uh, painting because he, painted during the summers in order to make extra money. So he didn't have to work while he was going to law school. And, uh, so I would sort of like tee up the houses that he should go check out. And, you know, he'd give me a couple bucks for sort of like finding the houses ultimately. And, you know, I didn't care. I was out riding my bike anyway. And so it was fun for me to go and find like the houses, but, you know, from him, I, I really learned like he was never going to be painting houses. That's not what he wanted to ultimately do, but he really like figured out, like, you know, he figured out that work that he needed to do in order to get what he wanted, which I think is such a big, you know, as I tell my kids all the time, like, you know, there's a lot of things I do every single day that are not necessarily like, you know, glamorous. Right. And, but you just got to do it right. In order to kind of get to that next level. And I'm sure you've got the same story and, you know, and your husband and everybody else, like, it's just, yeah. it's, it's a, you know, it's something that I think is like, if kids can really learn that early on, that it's not just about the fancy part of it, you've got to work hard and you've got to do things in order to get to that next step. Well, you came from a pretty laser focused family, so I see why you're so focused. Um, did you have the same focus in high school as well? Yeah, I mean, I think also just being the, the last of five kids and, you know, partly because my parents were both working and you know, they had me a little bit older. I think, you know, I, I somewhat joke about it, but somewhat serious. I think they were a little tired. Like my, my brothers were wild and, you know, my sisters were a little less so, but you know, my parents were just like, I, I think by the time they rolled around to me, I mean, they had sort of seen it all. And they were like, listen, you know, get home safe. Don't embarrass us. Like, you know, like that was sort of the, you know, that was sort of the, the deal. But I had the house where like all my friends would come over and hang out. And, you know, it's, uh, it's, uh, you know, certainly my parents weren't, you know, buying us beers or anything, but it was definitely a place where, um, you know, we were able to kind of hang out and, and really talk and be ourselves and be open. Um, you know, that, that was really the, the house that we were, that we were living in. Athletics was also a, such a key thing. That was probably the only thing that my parents said, like we absolutely had to do. All of us were always in a sport and they didn't care what sport we did. Um, it ended up that I was a gymnast. My sister was a swimmer. Um, 
my uh, brothers played everything. Um, they were constantly in doing different athletics, but I think it was like the one thing that we were never allowed not to be in the sport. And I think that that's also something that's taught me a lot, uh, you know, looking back and it's been a huge impact for me and being an entrepreneur. I think that, you know, especially I've seen it in female entrepreneurs that people who have done athletics, it's a, it's about reaching for a goal. It's about working hard. It's about falling down. It's about, you know, analyzing what happened. It's about teamwork. Um, all of those kind of things I think are just so important in, in being able to be a successful entrepreneur. Well, tell us about your, your favorite coach um, since you were a gymnast. How did they help you become a better gymnast? And how did you apply even those aspects to like anything you did outside of that sport? Yeah, I mean, my my main coach was a guy actually named Stormy Eaton, um, and so uh, so he uh, you know it's, it's, it's interesting. He passed away uh, probably I don't know a while ago, and um, in somewhat tragic accident, like over the Grand Canyon in in a helicopter, like it was just oh a stupid accident. But, um, but anyway, I mean, it's, it's interesting. I, I remember times when, uh, I mean, I, I remember one time in particular, I was, uh, I was doing the vault, which like vault and bars were really my two sports that I was kind of, um, the most, uh, competent, I should say at, I did the other ones, but I just, I never believed I'm not a very good dancer. And so for me, like being on doing floor, was like kind of hard because you sort of have to, I don't know. I just thought like the people who really got it really had groove of some sort. <laughs> and I, That was not me. And, um, but anyway, I, I remember like at one point I was trying to, uh, to do something on the vault and I, uh, I did a round off back handspring onto the vault and I landed right on the vault with all of my toes. Like I was, he kept telling me to point my toes. And so I had my toes like pointed and it was like sort of awkward for me. And then I landed on the top of the vault and I broke all of my toes Ugh. and oh my it gosh. just went crunch. And I remember like falling off and being like seeing stars immediately and he was like, get back up. And I was like, I can't walk. And he's like, get back up. And so he had a person run over to me at the vault and like tape up my feet. And so I like just basically like sat there and looked down like at the vault, not at my feet. And I really coached myself not to be in pain. Like, I just really was like, I've got this and I can do this. And then when I got home, like, I mean, my feet were just totally bruised. It, they were just a mess. And my mom was like, so angry. And I'm like, it's totally fine. Like, I'm going to be fine. And you, you can't do anything for toes anyway. And like, I mean, I have this, I basically, it was like my coach saying this. So, you know, was that healthy or not healthy? I don't know. I just think that you get to a point where, um, you know, you've, you've actually, like, I think a lot of things are in your mind. And I think that again, if you can coach yourself or have a coach coach you to sort of understand that, you know, you can do something and not fall down and just, you know, stop, I think more than anything. That's powerful. Wow. And, and my stomach hurts from, <laughs> from your toes breaking. I did. I'm like, ah. There were so many okay. other there were many other breaks along the way, but that was one actually that was uh, that was pretty crazy. Whew. Okay, did you keep um, at it when you went to Arizona State, or did you stop after the I, injury? I didn't actually. I mean, people who actually make the college teams are, like I said, really good at like all of the you know different. Okay. Um, the different areas. And so I didn't, um, I was just never really great at floor. And so anyway, I, I initially went to, so I went to ASU and, uh, practiced with them a little bit. And then actually my first, my freshman year at Arizona state, I was in a car accident and broke my neck. And so what? I was, yeah, so it was crazy. And so 
I was thrown through a windshield. Uh, my girlfriend was driving and I didn't have a seatbelt on and I went through the windshield and then, yeah, like it was crazy. But what saved me was actually my ability to tuck my head. So, you know, I always say that like, you know, you look back on life and sort of look at, you know, why did that, you know, why was I a gymnast, right? Like, I think, you know, if this car accident was going to happen, like, and I wasn't a gymnast, I could have just gone splat on the street because my head hit the pavement. It was pretty crazy. So, um, so anyway, so I broke my C7 and um, I still have a crack in it, but I just keep, you know, again, just keep going on. So it was weird. It was like for years, I couldn't feel my left hand. And, um, you know, I just had, I had like nerve damage going down my left arm. And then like 15 years later, it just started to come back. It was really crazy. And like, I, you know, a lot of doctors I went to were like, I don't know, like, it's like, it's hard to say whether or not you're going to get it back. You had a pretty, you know, nice crack in there. So, but yeah, crazy. So after that, like that sort of ended my gymnastics career. It's, it's funny when my kids were little, they, they took gymnastics, my girls, and uh, they, uh, they needed a spotter at the gymnastics for like these little kids. And so I was like, oh, I'll do it. And, uh, my kids were, my kids were like, we don't really believe you did gymnastics because you're really not that great of a spotter. <laughs> I was like, I did gymnastics. I didn't spot for people. Like, it's crazy. Yeah. So anyway, pretty funny. You, you better tell your kids that you're a superhero. You're like a, a living, breathing superhero because you I know. survived so much stuff. No, it's, let them it's crazy. Tell you, you're great. Did you do a <laughs> oh sport God. growing up? Oh, of course. I like almost every sport, I, volleyball, basketball, I ran track. I just was a busy kid. Yeah. yeah. Well, so and, you get uh, it. I mean, I think it's like, yeah. you know, getting back up and it's like not easy, you know, to just keep going. It isn't. It isn't. Well, tell us about your, your first job and what did you do specifically to get your foot in the door? So when I was uh, 15 years old, I actually, you know, I had older brothers and sisters who were all making money and I was not making money and they were buying fun clothes and, you know, whatever, going to movies and, you know, doing lots of stuff. And, you know, my parents had me on an allowance that like I could only spend so much. And so I just decided, I wonder if I could actually get a job. And so I got a job at a toy store um, in Scottsdale um, called ABC toys. And it was in like the little fifth Avenue shops. It's no longer there. Um, but it's, uh, it was just this tiny little toy store. And I walked in there. I used to go in there. My mom actually used to get her haircut like around the corner. And when she was getting her haircut, I'd like walk out and go toy shopping. And, um, anyway, so she, uh, so the lady who owned the toy store, I asked her if I could get a job and she never asked me how old I was. She was just like assuming, I guess that I was, you know, old enough or whatever. And so, uh, she said, you know, I need some help on Sundays and do you want to like do the store on Sundays? And I was like, sure. So I get the job on Sunday. And then what I didn't know was that she was going through a divorce and she had some, she had some, teenagers at home that she had to spend some more time with. And so she started asking me to do a lot of other stuff, including like buying for the store. So, um, so, I mean, it was crazy. Like I, I was like stocking the shelves of all like the cool stuff. And like, I increased revenues in the toy store by like four times within like the next year. I mean, it was insane. Cause I was a kid. Like I knew exactly what she should be selling. Like she had all these books in the store and I was like, uh, no, like that's probably (laughs) like, nobody really wants that. Like you have to have the really cool stuff. And, um, so anyway, it was, it was, uh, it was super fun. But, uh, then I think she woke up like after a year and realized like how old I was and she's like, oh my gosh, I had no idea. And so Anyway, it was pretty funny. She, so I did that job for a couple of years and then I actually ended up when I was, when I was in high school, I figured out that I could actually make more money by working at this local restaurant, uh, that's sort of an institution in, in Phoenix, um, called Teepee. 
um, TP tap room. So I worked at TP, like they let me kind of make my own hours whenever I wanted to make some extra money. And then I actually, because I was going to ASU, I, down in Tempe, I, um, ended up working there as well and doing waitressing and bartending. And it was, uh, yeah, it was really, it was super fun. Still my favorite Mexican restaurant in Phoenix. Ah, when I get out there, I got to try it. Thank you for that tip. <laughs> yeah, so it's so good. And it's been, and, you know, the other thing, it's funny, I, I tell the story when I take people there, I've never been there. You, if you order your, first of all, it's cheap and it's really good food. Like they make their own tortillas there. They're, you know, it's like the cheese is good. It doesn't have plastics in it. Like, you know, you can just taste, they've been using organic chicken for like, before it was even like important or cool in people's mind to have that. But um, the thing that I've always noticed is like it, it's not cost prohibitive to actually eat there. I don't think I've ever like for two people, I don't think my bill has ever been over like $40 with margaritas. Like it's like, it's crazy. It's so cheap and they give you so much food. And then the other thing that's crazy is that, it's like super fast. So they leave their ovens on whatever, like 600 degrees. And so the food like comes out so crazy fast. Like I remember us like waitressing and watching this and thinking like, why is it that this place like gets food out so fast, but other ones don't. And the people who are the owners who have owned it for years, it's been in their family I asked him that question. I'm like, why don't other restaurants like get food out fast? You guys get food out so fast. And they're like, well, it's always been like an important quality for us to like have that because we can actually turn tables over faster. Mm. And so that's the thing that I saw like in waitressing there. I mean, I would be like, you know, 20 years ago making like, you know, $200 a shift in, in tips, which is crazy right? Like as a college kid. And, Absolutely. and it was because it was just so fast, like, and they were able to, you know, just not have people sitting around. And what I realized is like, no customer wants to sit there. Like, maybe there's a few that want to like have a conversation or whatever. But most of the time, if you're coming in to just like eat, you want to eat, right? Like, and you want it fast. And you don't want to sit there for like 10 hours. And especially if you've you know, if you're a college kid or you have kids or whatever, you don't want to like wait around for forever. I mean, that's not what you're there to do. So, um, but just in terms of like a business thinking, I, I just think like that piece is, was like so important. I just thought on sort of a very simple le level, like it's like, it really is about speed and about like getting it out, you know, the door. And I mean, I think there's, there's just a lot of lessons there that I, think about when, you know, I think about our business too, that it's like, you know, even if it's not perfect, I think that the key thing is, is to keep moving and get things done fairly quickly. I think like the, the bigger you are as a company, it's sort of what, you know, people talk about all the time, that there's all these processes and everything just takes longer. And it's just like, you know, I like, that's my goal as a company. I don't want things to be that way. We should, there's no reason to sort of like get bogged down in, in all of these, like, you know, sort of policies and procedures and that sort of stuff. You have to have some in place, but I think it's like speed is so important. I kind of agree with you more. It seems like at a very young age, you were able to um, figure out time management and a lot of people struggle with that, especially when they're super young. Are there any like hacks or things that you did in college that you still use today since you were balancing so much then? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, uh, you know, going to a place like Arizona State University, when I was there, it was like 40,000 students. I mean, today there's, I think, 80,000 students going to ASU. There's with their online programs over 100,000. And, you know, it's like somewhat, some of my friends joke around with my husband who went to a much smaller school. It's like, you know, the, the thing, I mean, ASU has had some really successful people um, graduate from there from, you know, you know, everybody from, uh, you know, Kate Spade to, and Andy Spade and, and David Spade, the whole Spade family had gone to issue, but, uh, but, you know, lots of other people, um, 
the guy who's the CFO for the Verilux desks and, um, you know, there's, there's somebody from Chipotle. I mean, it's amazing, like, how many people had, had gone to ASU when you look back. But I think, like, the challenge with going to any large university like that is that to actually get classes is, uh, is super challenging. So you have to be able to, like, get in there, talk to your professors, and kind of get it done. Otherwise, like, it's really difficult to actually graduate even in, like, five years for people because you just can't get your classes. So it's really, I think you learn early, you know, negotiation skills and ways to, you know, kind of like get up early and get in line early for classes so that you'll get those. And I mean, it's not, it, I, I think like that really trained me to be organized. Like you just have to, you just have to get it done too. And, and the people who don't know how to get it done or believe like, you know, that they have to, um, they have that eventually it's going to happen for them or the system's unfair or whatever. It's like, you know what, just move on, just figure it out, like stop complaining and, and just actually just do it. And so I think like, that's a key thing that I learned um, just from going to a really large university. Mm -hmm. Well, you've had a pretty impressive journey um, throughout your career. So maybe you could share with our listeners, like, you know, once you graduated from college, which your first job was that led up to, you know, you kind of being the head woman in charge <laughs> over at Hint. Yeah. So, um, so I actually left ASU, graduated from ASU, and then I really wanted to write. And so I had, um, I was a minor in finance and I went uh, I moved to New York actually hoping to write for Fortune magazine and they wouldn't hire me because I didn't have an, enough experience. I didn't have any experience in writing other than the, other than the fact that I was a journalism major. And so they ended up, um, I took a job or got a job, I should, I should say, in circulation, um, which I didn't even know what circulation was at, at Time Inc. magazines, which Fortune is part of that, Sports Illustrated, People, et cetera. And um, so I got the job, really, like, truly took the job because I thought if I take this job, then eventually maybe I'll meet some people at Fortune and I'll be able to transfer into the editorial department. And then that never actually happened. I ended up figuring out what circulation was and really loving it. And it's um, circulation is kind of these, you know, that sort of on the low end of things, uh, the, the stuff like the, uh, the blow in insert cards into magazines, which often fall out. Um, that is like basically getting people to actually sign up for, um, for a subscription or then there's like the loyalty programs, et cetera. So that is in the magazine industry called circulation. So I was just fascinated by, you know, everything from like how you talk to a customer, how you get the, how, you know, if a customer is getting ready to cancel, you know, maybe you give them something, you know, that, that ends up enticing them to stay on. Like, are there certain prices that really, you know, get consumers to actually sign on? like the, the value of, um, 98, like 2898 versus like, you know, 2901, like the value in people's minds, like just by a few cents, like how, how much different that is. So all of those kind of metrics and, and learnings for me were just super important. Um, I then went on actually to, I got, uh, recruited out of time by, uh, a little company at the time called CNN and CNN was, uh, CNN was just getting going. There was like, you know, maybe 40% of households actually had this thing called cable. I was living in New York city and I couldn't actually get any television signal unless I, uh, had cable. And so I was living up on central park West and, uh, just off the park and, you know, I think too many tall buildings and trees, I couldn't get any signal. So I knew what CNN was. And they had this uh, idea for this thing called uh, the airport channel, which today is monitors and airports at different gates um, that are showing CNN. So 
that whole concept was Ted Turner's concept. He needed somebody to help him write a business plan and actually figure out like how to get the monitors into airports. And I had been managing a, a little part of uh, circulation at time called airline circulation and airport circu- circulation. And we were putting like magazines into airports and also putting them on the plane. And so, um, so basically CNN said, Hey, can you help us? I mean, you've had some conversations with airports. Can you help us get these monitors in? And I truly didn't know if I could, like I had never done it before, but I mean, I wasn't, I wasn't going to tell them that like they knew that, that I hadn't done it, but I was like, oh, yeah, let's go do it. I mean, I wasn't like, Oh gosh, I've never done that. This is really different. Like, you know, I was always a kid that was just like, okay, let's go try and see what happens. And you know, it'll be fun to actually see if I can do it. Um, you know, I think in some ways I, I sort of was, was gamifying things for myself to actually, I'd set goals and then I gamify things to see whether or not I could actually go and get it done. And so, um, so we did, I mean, we got it into Logan airport and JFK were the first airports. And then, uh, actually had met my husband right when I was starting at CNN. Uh, he was in law school in New York. And, uh, and then while I was working at CNN, he was trying to figure out what he wanted to do next. And he kept, he got lots of offers in New York at big firms and he just didn't really, he wasn't jazzed up about it. And I was, you know, here he's seeing me having so much fun. And he's like, you got to help me like, think about like, where should I go and get a job and where should I take a job? And I'm like, why do you want to stay in New York? I mean, you grew up in New York. Like, why do you want to be here? And he's like, because I don't know anywhere else. And I was just like, well, like, what do you want to do? I mean, why don't you start there? And, and so he's like, well, I really want to do technology law. I don't really want to do, you know, just any old corporate law. And so I said, well, why don't you just tell people that when you're interviewing and try and get into that? And then that'll help you figure out like where, what firm you should be at and what you should do. And so, uh, so everybody was telling him that he should go West because the internet stuff was all happening in Silicon Valley. And, um, so I was like, wow, yeah, San Francisco, that'd be awesome. That'd be so much fun. Not even thinking like I was really just trying to like help him brainstorm about what he should do next. But I'm like, I, I mean, unlike maybe other people, like I wasn't sitting here trying to like say like, oh, well, what about us? You know, I was like, go. Yeah, that'd be, wow, that's super cool. I've heard great things about San Francisco. Like I've been there a couple of times, but that's it. And uh, he was like, well, would you go with me? And I'm like, me? Like, I'm not getting into technology. Why would I go to San Francisco? And uh, so anyway, so we got engaged and I said, okay, fine, I'll go out there. And, but I want to move back to New York and in a couple of years. And he said, fine, like, we'll move back in a couple of years. And, and yeah, like 25 years later, we're still here. Like, um, I, I like laugh four kids later, 20 year company. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So, so anyway, so he got a job, he had a job before he came out here with a law firm. And then I was reading about, uh, this guy, Steve jobs in the wall street journal. And I, I had sort of followed him a bit before I was like, you know, when I was in college, actually, I remember the first totally aging myself, but the first um, maps were in college and I was taking computer class um, as part of my finance curriculum. And I just thought it was way easier than actually doing stuff on a typewriter to use the Mac. And everybody thought like, like no one was using the Macs. We had like brand new Macs in, in the computer lab, I remember. And so I just thought they were super cool and had done some research and figured out that it was Steve Jobs. So I knew Steve's name and was just like somewhat fascinated by how he had this vision to just make life easier and more graphically interesting and, you know, design. And I just thought he was really cool. So one day when I was just new to San Francisco, I opened up the Wall Street Journal and saw that there was uh, this article about this idea that Steve had uh, developed inside of Apple that was called On Passant in Apple. Um, but it was basically like you, the internet had to rely on baud modem speeds, um, they called it. So it was like everything was 
what what was termed dial up. And so I don't know if you remember, like in the in the early days of the Internet, like if you wanted to connect to the Internet, no one could be on the phone. Like you would, uh, I know my dad, my dad right? was a computer programmer, so I know all too well. <laughs> yeah, so no one could be on the phone. You'd get disconnected, or you'd hear beep, beep, beep you know, like it'd be like, oh, it's on the phone. Like it was like the crazy time. So, yeah, so think about those times. So, Steve had thought about this, uh, thought, well, if we're dealing with like bottom modem speeds where you really can't have graphics because they're already so slow and it'll even slow it down even more. Like, what if we put all the graphics on a disc and just tell the computer, tell the consumer, like, stick the disc in and you'll get the updates. And I was like, wow, if that works, that's really interesting. And I had been on a couple of services that were early internet services, CompuServe and Prodigy, which were like very text driven. And I had been looking on there for jobs, like, because I was moving from New York to San Francisco and I was doing like a little bit of research, but I had sort of thought like, God, it'd be so much better if it was like, you know, not a bunch of text running across the screen that, you know, gives you like blurry eyed and headaches after a while, but instead was like, you know, nice looking like a magazine. I had sort of thought about that. And so here I'm reading that Steve had this idea, not only an idea, but also a solution. And so I just like picked up the phone. I didn't have a job. So I thought, what do I have to lose? And I picked up the phone and reached out to the person quoted in the article. And I said, Hey, I'm, I just moved to San Francisco and I saw your article. And, uh, and I think San Mateo is, is, uh, that's where this, uh, company was based. It was, they had spun the three guys that worked for Steve had spun it out into the separate company now outside of Apple called it two market. And I said, can I, you know, come down and have lunch with you? And he was like, uh, sure. Like, are you looking for a job or what, what are we talking about? And I said, no, I, I just, um, I'm just really interested in this. I'm trying to figure out what I want to do next. And he's like, Oh, well, what's your background? I told him about CNN and time. And I said, you know, I, I'm just really focused on the customer and like trying to figure out like what the customer wants, but what they're willing to pay for it. And he was like, yeah, no, I, that sounds really interesting. Sure. So I go down and have lunch with this guy. And then, uh, while I was there, there was, uh, this other guy, Steve was there and I knew it wasn't Steve jobs and it was this guy, Steve case. And he was the founder of AOL and he was, um, and I was like, oh, so what do you do for the company? And he said, oh, I, I actually don't work in the company. I'm an investor in the company. And so we invested alongside um, Apple. And I had never heard of America Online. And um, so anyway, I just kept asking him, I mean, here's three engineers and product guys who are running this company. And I kept asking them, like, how do you actually make money? And um and so Steve said, you know, you guys should really hire her because she really cares about money and maybe she'll actually help you figure out like this business plan. And so I, uh, I got hired and got some equity, which was like great. I had never seen equity at any of my jobs in New York. And so I get the equity and then, um, and then basically I'm running this thing called business development where I'm going out and trying to get people to actually put their um, stuff, mostly their catalogs. Um, so everybody from, you know, the gap to LL bean to J crew to, uh, the old tower records. I mean, it was like, it was crazy. And I had no idea what I was doing. Like I was like, you know, I had no business, like even having that job at all. Like they had so much faith that I was able to go and do it. And so anyway, six months into having this job, I, we, AOL decided to acquire us. And so I'm now working for a company in San Francisco, but is actually based in Virginia and, um, like the DC area. And I, uh, I, I ended up uh, commuting. They let me commute every week. Um, so I was on the United flight on Monday morning until Friday night for years. I mean, it was like, not the way to like start off your marriage at all, but it was like, I loved my job and sort of what I did, but it was like, we just had such crazy growth. So anyway, I was there for seven years, ended up growing it to be a billion dollar business, running a team of 200 people, um, telling them how to sell into it. I mean, AOL had like 
you know, we really like had the marketplace for e-commerce. It was insane. Talk to, you know, young entrepreneurs like Jeff Bezos. That's probably my favorite story. We like couldn't get a deal with Barnes and Noble or Borders as our like book retailer. So we heard about this guy in Seattle that was, you know, just doing books. For those who don't remember this, like that's where Amazon started. They were just books Mm -hmm. at one point. So, um, so anyway, it was a crazy, fascinating time. And then, you know, ultimately I got off the ride at like seven years. I just decided, I think it's time to actually go and do something different and, um, and not be traveling so much. I had young kids and I was pregnant with my third and I thought, you know, I want to just do something that really makes a difference and, and makes me, you know, want to get up every day. And I, had, again, like really what I've learned about myself too, is I'm a builder. And so for me, when things just started getting to be like, you know, clock punching a little bit and managing status quo, like it was something that I wasn't as interested in, not to say that it wasn't important. It was just not really what I really was like super interested in. That was a lot. Of yeah, life. right? <laughs> crazy. Oh. My crazy so life. Crazy. Oh, you have an amazing life. Oh, my goodness. Wow. I mean, you must be so proud of yourself, but I'm sure, you know, your children looking up to you. Um, it speaks volumes. It's great to see, you know, a woman uh, go on this journey and do it with such, you know, class and, and fearlessness. So... Bravo to you. That's amazing. Okay. So what would you say was the biggest risk you've ever taken? Like out of all of that, what was the you biggest know, risk? I, I think for me, it's just like, anytime I look at risks, I think of it as just a learning experience and not something that is, uh, you know, that it, I, I don't know. I mean, I I think everything I've done, you know, depending on who's looking at it, it says like everything from leaving Arizona and moving to New York to, you know, trying to get a job at, you know, a major magazine to, uh, you know, working alongside CNN and the leaders there in order to build something totally new. I think it's just, you know, and then, and then the whole two market and AOL thing. And then, and then hint. I mean, I think everything and depending on someone's lens, like looks incredibly risky, um, you know, but, but as time goes on, you really see that it's, you know, I've been able to do things that I think I've been gifted to sort of look at things with a little bit different lens to just go off and do it. I mean, I, I just, I look at my life as kind of this big puzzle and it just keeps building. Right. And I'm not, I'm a, like I said, I'm really a builder and I'm not somebody who is, um, who is, um, really like dead set on being in technology or in CPG or anything like that. So I, I think it's just a matter of like, really, um, can you satisfy the customers and solve a problem? Yeah. Well, as a CEO and founder of a pretty successful, you know, healthy beverage brand, plus you're also a mother, a wife, what does a successful day look like for you? Uh, so I get up every morning and hike. Um, if I don't hike, I'm, I'm a little bit of a mess. And so, uh, so I've got to find, like yesterday, I didn't have time to do it, and then I ended up going hiking around here. Um, so I think, like, for me, you know, a a, a lot of indoor outdoor time. Um, I can't just be inside. Like I think if I lived in, in a place where I was forced to like always be inside because it was too cold or I, I think that's, you know, my Arizona upbringing too, that I was just so used to like spending a lot of time outside. It's just, I, I love the outdoors. So that's has to be a big part of my day. Um, and then, and then just overall, like, I think just being able to, see the people I love, right. Whether it's like, you know, my family, my friends, my, you know, team here at work. Like I, I love being around people. Um, so I, I could never just work by myself and not communicate with people. Like, I think like that to me would just be like, to me, like going on a vacation by myself, like would be like, 
I, I'd have to meet people immediately. Like I, I think I would just go stir crazy. So that for me is just like, you know, I get energy from lots of other people. Yeah. And starting a business can be pretty scary. I mean, I, I know this from my own personal experience. Um, was there like a book or anything that you read that helped you when you were launching your company? You know, I've read a bunch of different um I'm a constant reader, I think partly because I'm on the plane so much that I've just found like, I also like paper a lot, you know, when it comes to, uh, you know, what kind of books I actually, or, or the format, I should say of, of the different books, but, uh, there's a few different books in particular that I, you know, would say are some of my most favorite books, uh, Lately, I just read a really, really interesting book um, that was uh, by Beth Comstock, who was the uh, CMO of GE, and it's called Imagine It Forward. About and really, her whole life of of you know just basically like finding what she ultimately was passionate about, but also her experience at GE. So I'd say like that was one that was was one of my favorites. And then also just from a, you know, kind of sort of realizing the entrepreneurial journey, I would say uh, that another book, Outliers, is another one that is also a really, really great book. Um, and then I'm still a, a huge fan of uh, of. Warren Buffett. Um, there's a book that sort of highlights exactly what's gone on Berkshire beyond Buffett. Um, but it highlights it's by Lawrence Cunningham, but it really highlights a lot of, you know, what was learned and values that were learned, um, when, you know, he was there. So those are just a few of them that I think are really, uh, that are pretty great. And I would say like the last one that I really enjoyed is, um, Gary, Gary Vaynerchuk. Um, a lot of people call him Gary V. There's a book that he wrote a few years ago called crushing it. Um, so I think like that's another one that I, that is pretty great. Well, those are all fantastic. I've read those. So yeah, <laughs> thank you. Yeah. So much, except for the You're, one you recently, the re- the one you recently read, I did not read that one. So I'm going to add that to my list for sure. Yeah. It's a good one. Okay, I'm going to ask you some rapid fire questions. So you have to spit these answers out. All right. Uh, <laughs> all right. So tell us how many times a week do you exercise? 10. Wow. 10? What, twice a day? I do. Sometimes? Yeah, sometimes. That's awesome. Okay, and hiking, what's your favorite mostly. Workout? And hiking. Okay. Hiking. Hiking is your favorite. Okay. Uh, what's always in your gym bag all the time? Hint. Of course. Of course it is. Uh, what's the one thing that can make or break your workout? Uh, music. Mm, what's on your workout playlist? You know, I, I think uh, I would say that Beyonce is still, you know, one of my favorites and, and a good go to along the way. I think it's uh, anything inspirational. Do you typically eat before a workout or after? After. And what do you normally grab right after? A uh, banana. Ah, and on a cheat day, what's your go-to? Uh, there's a uh, yogurt that is from Press Juicery that is so yummy. That is made out of uh, almonds, and it's really, really yummy. I love that that's your cheat day meal, something healthy. Yeah, <laughs> you are totally. No Mexican food, no pizza. Okay. You I'm, know what? I'm, There's I'm not loving. great Mexican, I don't think, coming from Arizona in San Francisco. Okay. Well, there you have it. So it helps. Yeah, <laughs> for right? sure. Okay. Yeah, it totally does. All right, now my favorite question, uh, which deodorant do you swear by? Well, uh, truth be told, we're coming out with our own. Uh, so I've been wearing that for the last couple of years. So I would say that it's that. Okay. 
And when you hear the words, pretty girls sweat, what do they mean to you? I think that it's, uh, it's, it's hardworking women, right? Like, I think like that's, that's what it really means to me. I think it's just a matter of, uh, you know, they don't just show up as being, you know, super pretty. It's the ones that are like the hardworking and hustlers that are out there doing it and trying and all those things. So anyway, that's, that's for me, I think that the key, the key thing that I hear in that. And you said deodorant's coming out soon. We're waiting. We need a, a date. Like, when is that hitting shelves? We don't have an exact date yet, but we'll definitely let you know. Okay. So what, is there anything else that we should be on the lookout for that's coming up next? I don't think so. I mean, actually, we just launched our Ginger Fizz, which is our carbonated version of our product. And it is so yummy. It's, like, so great. So definitely look out for that. And I've been told that you can also use it for... Uh, for different uh, Moscow mm -hmm. Mule drinks and lots of other fun stuff too. So definitely could be a great drink coming up for summer as well. I'm like sold. <laughs> you yeah. sold me on oh, Moscow yeah. So Mule. good. <laughs> and you have the juice boxes as well. Well, the, the water boxes. For yeah, sure. exactly. That's what I was going to say too, that that's like another amazing thing that we just came out with. So definitely. I'm so that's excited. Yeah, super fun. All of your all of your products work well in my household, so thank you. Yeah, <laughs> across the board. And if there's just one thing to a young, you know, woman who's you know in college or just starting out her career, who's listening, something important you want to share with her, what would you say? I think just believe in yourself, and and really, the you're always the the most successful companies have tons of, you know, head. I would say your entrepreneur has heard so many, you know, it's not going to happen naysayers beforehand. And I think this is, this is where you, you know, really have to figure out like, is this what you want to do? And if it's what you want to do, go out and get it. And if there's anyone listening, that's like, how in the world does she run a company and still work out 10 times a week? I could, and they're saying to themselves, I can never do that. What, what advice would you give to them? So I figure out how to put workouts into my day, including things like, uh, I call them walk and talk. So I do a lot of conference calls while I'm out walking and hiking. Sometimes we have, um, in San Francisco, we're right in, uh, on Union Street, um, kind of in the Pacific Heights area of San Francisco, Marina area of San Francisco, and there's a bunch of stairs and um, right right by our office. And so often I, I tell people, if you hear me huffing and puffing, it's not weird. It's, it's that I'm uh, climbing upstairs while I'm talking to you to try and get my exercise in. So, I mean, sometimes I, I walk nine, 10 miles a day um, just by doing that. So... Definitely, you can figure out how to get it done. To learn more, search Kara Golden on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, and on Twitter. You can also check out her company's website, drinkhint.com, and do yourself a favor and take a listen to her podcast, Unstoppable. It's filled with tons of information and lots of inspiration. Just one more thing before you take off. Do you want to get a short email from Pretty Girl Sweat every Monday and Friday that serves as a daily dose of all things inspiring and allows you priority access to our upcoming events? Just go to prettygirlsweat.com. That's prettygirls with an S, sweat.com. Drop in your email and you'll get the very next one. And if you sign up, you'll soon discover that there's no hood like sisterhood. Until next time, always remember that good things come to those who sweat.